Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to another edition of our College Transition Webinar Series. Um, today we're going to be highlighting the Honors Program at Elmhurst University. Um, I am an admission counselor on the transfer side of the office. I was in the Honors Program when I went to Elmhurst, um, which was then college, now university. Very exciting. Um, so I was a part of it, so I'm here to introduce you all and um, we're going to have couple people here presenting and we're going to be talking all about the honors program. I'm going to save the Q&A until the end, but please feel free to utilize the chat box. If you're not familiar with where that is, at the bottom of your screen, a little bubble that says chat. I will be monitoring the whole time. If I feel like there's a question that maybe pertains to what we're talking about at the time, then we can always take time for that. But I'm going to aim to have those answered at the end. Um, and so now I am going to have uh, Karina put up her PowerPoint. I believe Mary Kay will be taking it away and um, I'll be here to monitor that chat. Okay. So welcome everyone. Um, thank you for your interest in the Elmhurst University Honors Program. I'm Dr. Mary Kay Mulvaney, director of the program and a professor in the Department of English at the university. I'm going to briefly explain to you how the honors program works. The program is for talented, motivated students who want to participate in some amazing opportunities while they're here at, the, uh, at Elmhurst University. I'm happy to share some details of the opportunities of, throughout this presentation. And as Val mentioned, we'll have questions at the end. I will be joined by two of my colleagues, um, Dr. Maladin Turk, um, the Assistant Faculty Director, and Ms. Karina Rivera, and they'll both introduce themselves when we get to their parts in this and let you know exactly what they do in the program anyway. Um, Elmhurst is an institutional member of the National Collegiate Honors Council, better known as NCHC. It's a professional association of honors programs and colleges from across the country of over 900 member institutions of which we are one. Indeed, we actually have members internationally now, so it's across the world. We are an active member every year at the annual conference, faculty and students present their research and work within honors. I personally have served on the national board and I'm currently in, in press, soon to be out, to be held, <laughs> hopefully my second book on honors education published by NCHC. I've also been fairly recently honored to be named one of about 75 national fellows for my research in honors. Our mission and pro, uh, program mission and goals are a lot of words in front of you right now, but just to break this down a little bit, the program is designed to provide uh, an enhanced educational experience for distinguished undergraduates who are intellectually curious and committed to a deeper, broader, more complex university experience. We have multiple specific goals. Before I go into those, I just want to mention one thing, particularly for those of you listening who may be coming out of uh, high school or recently remember your high school experience. The honors program is not the same thing as an honors track in high school. It does not require a lot of extra work, sometimes busy work. I know some of you may be kind of burned out from a few too many AP classes. It does not require a full load of honors courses each term. Rather, it's flexible. It's designed to work with your major and your interests. It's designed to guide and ignite and foster your interests and your intellectual curiosity. And hopefully to provide you an avenue for lifelong bonds with great friends who love learning and having fun just like you. Here's how it works. There are three possible levels of distinction to earn by the time you graduate. Honors program member requires 4.75 honors courses, all of, all of these with a B or better. If you're familiar with our credit system already, it's a little different than a lot of other institutions, those of you that are coming from other places. So 4.75 courses is equivalent to 19 semester hours. The reason we talk about 0.75, we do, as you'll see, have some courses that are partial credit, 0 0.25, 0 0.5, making them more flexible, add to your regular load. 
Honors Program Scholar requires 6.5 courses or uh, 26 semester hours in a more typical system and including an undergraduate research component. And you'll hear more about that in a little while, specifically from Dr. Kirk. Our highest distinction, and the one that we hope you'll all aim for, although certainly it's not required, is Honors Program Global Scholar. That also requires the 6.5 courses, or 19 semester hours, including the research component and a credit-bearing study abroad experience. And I'll be sharing more information about those too. These distinctions are recognized on your diploma and your transcript, so they're official documents, uh, officially recorded on your record. You're honored at a special graduate celebration with the university administrators, you're named in the graduation booklet, and so on. It is possible, again, for any major to participate. Indeed, every year, nearly 30 different majors are represented among our honors program graduates. One thing to keep in mind is you do not need to declare ahead of time that you're aiming for member or scholar or global scholar. These are distinctions that you can keep, in essence, chipping away at, earning as you go. You simply work towards your goal little by little. If you need to change down the line, that's an easy change. You just let us know by a quick email and we change your record. Students often tell me the best part about being in the honors program is being in classes with fellow students who come from a wide variety of backgrounds. So they're interested in different things. People in the program have all different majors, as I've said, and they're interested in inquiry-based courses. And many of those courses, keep in mind, will fulfill your university requirements as part of the integrated curriculum. They're not necessarily, quote unquote, extra. So this is a list of some of the course options. It's certainly not every single course, but just to give you an idea. All first year students, if some of you listening are incoming as first year or will be perhaps next year, are required to take a first year seminar course. If you're in the honors program, you select from one of four different honor, topic-based honors program first year seminars. Um, or uh, you may, for instance, overlap courses with your, what we used to call ECIC, just Integrated Curriculum Now, the numerous options every term. So for instance, if you still need to take your college level writing course of English 106, your Composition 2, you could take an honor section of English 106 and quote unquote double dip for that requirement and fulfilling an honors program requirement. Or you might take an introductory psychology course or a history course for your historical analysis category and so on. If you're a transfer student, many of your entry courses we understand will already be completed, but there still are course options. One thing you're all allowed to convert one quote unquote, regular course to an honors option. That's what it says at the very bottom of this list. So that could be one of your courses. Transfer students are allowed to transfer in credits from a previous honors program. So if you were in an honors program, perhaps at your community college or um, whatever institution you're coming from, you give us a transcript and we take care of transferring that credit. Um, you can't transfer all of it, you still have to take some courses, but you can definitely be about halfway there for your honors program distinction. There are also many elective options that are listed on here. There are separate or distinct, I should say, honors program electives every January term or J term that vary from year to year. And then we have numerous things that are in the partial credit category. The next several on this list, the intercultural seminar, which is built around the intercultural lectures, is a 0.25 course that's repeatable for credit. It's only six weeks long. It's offered every term, so you could take that four times or eight times and, and accumulate um, 
a full credit or two full credits or, or whatever combination along the way. The um, Honor Service Seminar is another one. I'm going to skip the British Life for a moment. That takes place as an online course if you're studying overseas. The Service Seminar is another 0.5. You engage um, in discussions about the challenges and uh, in different theories of respectful service, and then you participate in a community site of your choice that we help place you in. Model UN is a great 0.5 experience. We are a member of the American Model UN Association, a, a university member. So we have a team every year in the mock United Nations conference that involves hundreds of college and university students from across the country. They, every year we have a different country that we're assigned and different committees are on. That's also repeatable for credit. Directed readings is repeatable for credit. For um, most of our honor students love to read. You discuss a text in small groups with a professor and a few other students and so on. The, um, the last thing that's named there are, are near the very end are honors 404, the interdisciplinary seminar and the 495. Those are our two research options. And to tell you a little bit more about that, I'm going to introduce the assistant faculty director, Dr. Maladin Turk, and he will fill you in. Maladin. Thank you, Dr. Um, oh, hi, everyone. Welcome to Elmhurst University. As Dr. Mulvaney said, I'm Maladin Turk. I'm um, the assistant director of the honors program. I'm also a professor and chair in the Department of Religious Studies. A few words about me, I do uh, research and publications in the area of history and methodology of, of, of the study of religion, and uh, with special focus on uh, questions within the field of religion and science. And uh, I also do uh, research and publications in the area of cognitive science of religion. And in that capacity, I also teach courses for the honors program in religion and science, and also courses like uh, religious classics and so on. But here, uh, most important for us is uh, to discuss uh, what Dr. Molini just mentioned about various research opportunities. And there are more research opportunities at Elmhurst University than just through the honors program. But in the honors program, we focus on two main ways how you can achieve uh, your designations of either honor scholar or honor global scholar for which you are required to have research component. Uh, we maintain very strong uh, undergraduate research program. Uh, what that means is really that research is geared towards what undergraduate students uh, these days can do and in many ways are also expected to do. So this means you know you can go as high as you want with what you're capable to do but uh, th this program is specifically designed to uh, introduce you into what does it mean to conduct research. And when I say research, we mean that in very broad terms, which means that, uh, you know, in some fields that might be obvious if you are in biology, if you are in chemistry, if you are in physics, if you are in psychology, you might think uh, uh, those fields uh, lend themselves to what we call research. However, we actually uh, have uh, many students and we uh, have programs that come from all of our majors right so we over the years we had uh, students especially from uh, nursing or art or music or literature or philosophy religious studies who who did uh, who did uh, their undergraduate research uh, and of course it depends on your on your uh, chosen field, uh, what methodology and how are you going to proceed doing that. So there are, as uh, Dr. Mulvaney already, already mentioned, there are two primary uh, programs, two pr primary courses to which we offer undergraduate research. One is Honors 404, Honors Interdisciplinary Seminar. It is just amazing to see a range of topics covered there. And what happens in those interdisciplinary seminars is that you have at least, you have one faculty member who is uh, coordinating uh, all seminar. However, you have at least five or more uh, faculty members from many different fields appropriate to address one and the same set of questions. So you have one issue covered from about five or more different points of view. This is by definition, what does it mean to think critically? You see, you take one thing and then you turn it from, many different points of view. So just to give you an idea, 
So recently we had seminar on poverty. Uh, we had one on exploring US cultural identities, on cultural isms, on technology, self and society, on uh, terrorism, on mental health challenges. And I think the upcoming is on 21st century Chicago. So basically what that means is you have this one topic, let's say mental health, and then you deal with it from many different points of view. And so depending on your background, depending on your major, you pick and choose which methodology do you want to use. And then you work closely with your faculty research mentor in that course to develop your own uh, research agenda, your own research uh, program uh, that, that then culminates in you producing work that would be uh, on the expected level for your undergraduate um, uh, academic status. And of course, both uh, Honors 404 and Honors 495 that I'll, or 495 Honors Independent Research, that I'll uh, say a few more words in a moment, they both require you to then also disseminate your work, to present your work, and that is one thing that the Honors Program here at Elmhurst University uh, works with you very closely in achieving. So you'll be able to present your work at national, regional, some regional, some even are local here uh, on campus, but all, definitely on, on you will have the opportunity to present your work on national level. Uh, if any of you are interested in pursuing uh, further academic studies in any uh, graduate program later on, uh, it is almost uh, required these days to have research component completed on your undergraduate level. And as I said earlier, this is, there is no better way of doing this because when you go to a graduate level, you do more research on that level and so on and so on. Those things are cumulative, so you have to begin somewhere. And there is no better place to begin than with those courses we have here. And then uh, the second program that, that uh, I wanted to say a few words about, this is our flagship program in undergraduate research. It is absolutely fantastic. It's something that uh, uh, so many of our students uh, over the years benefited so much from. This is uh, 495 Honors Independent Research. And basically 495 is its a numerical designation, but that prefix that comes uh, at the beginning of all of our courses comes from any department where you decide to take that course. So for example, you, if, you are, if your major is biology or psychology or history or literature or, something, or English, something like that, your prefix would be history 495 or psychology 495, biology 495, chemistry 495, and so on. All 495 courses are honors independent research. They are all 0.5 uh, credit, uh, and uh, they are all repeatable for credit. So this means uh, from the time you qualify to take one of those courses, you can take one over and over every semester, and you can both accumulate your uh, credits towards your honors, uh, honors designation, but you can also definitely pursue your research further and further, deeper and deeper, or explore different topics uh, that, that uh, you can choose. So basically how that works is you, you uh, prior to the semester, you intend to enroll in one of those 495s, you talk to your faculty research advisor, you pick your faculty, someone you would like to work with and ask them, what, what is it you can do research in? Or alternatively, you can uh, think of something you would like to do research on yourself and then talk to your faculty and ask them if you can do research with them on your chosen topic. You can, of course, at any time contact me or contact Dr. Mulvaney, especially for 495, you should definitely contact me and we, I can work with you on both helping you decide uh, whom to talk to to, uh, to commence your independent research. And uh, then, uh, you know, those courses are very flexible. Your schedule will be agreed upon uh, with you and your faculty research advisor, and uh, you will work out your research program. Uh, so in order to apply, our application for that program is online. At the moment, we are in trans transitioning from one system to another. But if you have any questions about how to sign up for 495, you can ask me and I would be happy to discuss that uh, with you further. Just to mention some topics, and over the years, I, I'm uh, looking into every, uh, uh, every uh, in honors independent research uh, program that was done in, in past several years. 
and a uh, range of topics uh, Diaz covered are just uh, what I personally believe, what I think our program is really about, is what I think uh, undergraduate education uh, should be about, ought to be about. So we have a whole range of topics, as I mentioned earlier. So we had art and politics. We had a research, there is one I see now, the ethics of transhumanism through technology. Uh, uh, the, the, examining the role of inflammation in learning and memory. Uh, we had numerous uh, examples of research in chemistry, in, in biology, on uh, research that has to do with things with cancer or that has to do with how to uh, use a, a certain uh, lab technologies and so on. So from social identity or well-being, from political science, there's one I see here, politically incorrect language, the self and well-being. So there is really no limit to what you can choose to do your research on. And then a uh, great benefit for you is that you can work one-on-one -on -one with your faculty research mentor and they can guide you in how to craft, how to uh, put together all necessary components to, to, to make your research successful. Again, as I said earlier, uh, you will then be asked to submit your final product to uh, one of those uh, national conferences that we take our students to, and then at the end, if accepted, the honors program uh, uh, finances, you going to, we all go together there where you can present your work in one of those national conferences, either, uh, uh, on a national honors conference or national conference for, for undergraduate research. Again, if you have any, I'm so glad to meet you. I'm so glad to see you, but I really hope I'll hear from you later on. You will have questions, but if you have any questions about undergraduate research uh, in the honors program, please uh, contact me and let me know. Thank you. So besides undergraduate research, which is hugely important as Dr. Turk was just talking about and really fun and exciting for students too, uh, another major focus within the program is study abroad. We believe that having that international experience to advance your global knowledge and perspective is irreplaceable. Um, and so we do everything we can with including donor fund to solicit donor funding to help make it possible financially. But we provide uh, you access to programs literally all over the world. About half of our uh, honors program graduates have studied abroad by the time they finish their time at Elmhurst. So to, um, I do wanna mention that there are opportunities literally around the globe. You can choose from a three week short term experience during January term. I personally have taught many of those myself as has Dr. Turk. Um, or you can do a full term uh, in spring term or fall term overseas. We have an honors only spring term option that's very exciting that we just got started last year uh, as a joint program with Liber Liverpool Hope University, a nationally recognized university in Liverpool, England. That was just an amazing experience for our eight students that piloted it last year. That program doesn't cost you any more than your Elmhurst. It's a direct, Elmhurst tuition is a direct exchange in terms of funding, and it includes a special orientation experience in, in London for five days that I lead you through. You take courses at Liverpool Hope University in whatever your major area is. It's specifically designed for first and second year students, but also upper level students, depending on your major. The, uh, you would simultaneously be taking a course called British Life and Culture that's an online course I teach that kind of umbrellas the whole experience and focuses on British history and Liverpool, specifically Liverpool history. So I have a lot more I could say about that and more things we could talk about. If you have specific interest in the Liverpool Hope, please let me know or put your name in chat because I'm going to be gathering an info session group together for that um, pretty soon. In the meantime, I would like to stop talking at you and let you listen to two students um, share their testimonials about their study away experience. One from uh, a student who experienced it, did her work in Italy, and another one on the island of Martinique, which is an offshore state of France. So we'll let them talk to you about that. Karina starts these videos for me.
safe, it can be difficult to even consider studying abroad. However, I encourage every student to not cast aside their dreams of studying abroad, as the effects of it are life-changing and will affect how life is lived upon return. The biggest takeaway I got from studying abroad was a new sense of independence. Before studying abroad, there were many things that I was afraid to do on my own. Now after studying abroad, I feel a lot more capable. I feel less afraid to explore the world and branch out from what I am comfortable with. Studying abroad also allowed me to gain a larger appreciation for cultures outside of my own. Experiencing these cultures not only gave me a more worldly perspective, but also allowed me to see my country and cultures found here in a different light. There was really no alternative experience to studying abroad. While it might seem scary to some to travel abroad, I think that it is essential to every student experience if possible. It not only allows one to learn more about the world through first-hand experiences, but it also lets one come back with a better sense of themselves. I am definitely a different person after studying abroad and for the better. It is definitely true when they say that after studying abroad once, you'll want to keep on traveling. Those through study abroad, I realized that any experience that involves learning outside the traditional classroom is beneficial. Thus, I advocate for not only myself, but also for my peers to take advantage of these opportunities when they are able to, even if they are local. While classroom learning is nonetheless essential to the college experience, one cannot have a true grasp of the world unless they experience it themselves. That one was obviously Martinique, and we have another short one to show you about Italy. Just give me one second, I'm gonna pull sure. it up on YouTube. I hope you got the idea in the beginning of Marissa's that she was hesitant to go, but she loved it. So if you're feeling at all apprehensive, it's a good one to listen to. Hi, um, my name is Hannah Bacon. I'm a sophomore at Elmhurst College, a double major in political science and environmental studies. And I got to travel to Italy for a whole month and it was super awesome. So to give you a little background, we actually started down in Sicily at the city of uh, Palermo. We traveled all the way down to Agrigento, to Syracuse and ended in Termina, which was beautiful. I definitely want to go back there in the summer. Um, so then we went on to the mainland of Italy and we went up and spent our last 10 days in Rome. And it was super awesome. I learned so much history that I never read about in my textbooks. And the best part was you actually got to see and touch, sometimes touch, uh, the history that you were reading about. So everything was just brought to life. It was just, a whole different experience. It's really hard to explain in words, but it was just breathtaking, honestly. And I did a lot of learning through my uh, academic side, but I also did a lot of personal growth. And um, one big takeaway that this experience uh, showed me is that like, there's so much beauty in the complexity of this world. Um, learning about the history and it not always making sense, but it's there and then like, being in current times where you see the Coliseum and then a block over or something, you see an Apple store, you're like, what is this? Like, it's just so interesting, so different, um, sometimes confusing, and that's okay. I learned to just take it in for where it's at um, and accept it and find the beauty right there in that moment, even if it doesn't all make sense or even if I'm like a little overwhelmed with all, all the different perspectives or, you know, it's just, there's a lot, especially in this COVID time, um, this environmental crisis, I'll say, um, or this political turmoil. It's all complex and it's all confusing at points, but uh, I think there's a lesson built in somewhere and there's beauty within all that junk. Um, and Italy being there and just immersed in a new culture and immersed in new complexities really allowed me to appreciate that beauty more and yeah i would just recommend after this whole quarantine is over getting on a plane or a, a boat <laughs> i don't know just travel somewhere it's amazing especially having that educational outlet with it 
allows you to really um, just know a lot more than a tour guide would ever show you. So uh, really recommend this experience. Can't wait to hear how yours went. So yeah, thanks for listening. When, um, thank you, Karina. Uh, and when you return, you may want to experience even more of the world by applying for something like the prestigious Fulbright Scholar Program, a full year of funding to live abroad and work and study. The Honors Program provides specialized advising for the Fulbright and other highly competitive but incredibly impactful programs. It's sometimes referred to as the nationally competitive scholarship and fellowship. Um, group of nationally competitive scholarships and fellowships. The Fulbright, the Truman, the Pickering, the Udall, there are many, many of them. And uh, I am the campus advisor for many of the programs and um, Dr. Turk is as well. And we're happy to assist you with those. The honors program also includes lots of fun academic, non-academic components, I should say, uh, to embellish your time at Elmhurst. So to explain some of those features, I'm going to turn to Ms. Karina Rivera and she will introduce herself and share some things about that. Hi everyone. Um, my name is Karina Rivera. I am one of the coordinators in the honors program. And specifically, I work with the social side or the co-curricular side of the honors program. So you heard a lot about the academic side of the honors program uh, from what Dr. Mulvaney and Dr. Turk talked about, but I wanna talk a little bit about the social side. Um, so as an honors program member, you are automatically a part of ECHO, and ECHO is our honors program student organization. So they are the largest student organization on campus and recognized by our student government association. So it's a legitimate organization. Um, and ECHO is led by a group of about six board members who are students, and these are the students who are in charge of planning the programming and the different events. Uh, through the honors program for honors program members and many times we also plan programs for the entire campus so it, it isn't always necessarily just honors program members but we do like to provide that platform for you all to engage with each other um, so as I you can kind of read on this screen the different events that we host uh, some of the most exciting ones are lunch in the lounge so the second Tuesday of every single month, um, we've got lunch in the lounge in our honors program lounge, which you all have access to this year. That will look a little bit different, um, but we still want to, again, provide all of these opportunities for you all just in a different creative way. So, and then you can also see some of the other social events that we do throughout the year and end of the year social, um, end of the term social, things like that. I also work with the honors living learning community. So this was new last year uh, and it was very successful. So it is a uh, wing of Curitan Hall, which is one of our most coveted residence halls uh, because it's got air conditioning. So uh, there's a wing of Curitan Hall that is for honors program members. And so you can apply to live in the living learning community. Again, last year was the first year that we did that and it was very successful. We had so many students who wanted to return to it but we had just a few uh, returners who returned and then the rest of the um, beds and slots were for incoming students transfer or first year. It is a pretty diverse community and so there isn't just first year students or only returning students. I think it's a pretty good blend. Um, and so that's something nice about it. If you've got any questions about that, please let me know. We are currently on a wait list for the Honors Living Learning Community, but things are always shifting. And so if you'd like to put in an application, you can let me know or you can let Val know and she can let me know. So uh, I also just wanna quickly wanna talk about service and civic engagement. These are two really important things in the honors program. They're in our mission, they're in our goals. You'll find a lot of service learning components in many of the honors program courses. And through the honors program and through the uh, student organization ECHO, we work with various Chicago-based organizations, but these are just two of them, Mercy Home and the Knight Ministry. Um, we work with these quite a bit through just uh, fundraisers, different projects that we do. We bring people on campus, things like that. And then you'll also find other volunteer and service opportunities um, through ECHO. Our service chair will plan some service programs and things and then you'll also find them in some of your courses. So there's kind of a variety of places that you'll find this. And um, 
finally, I'll talk about the new member retreat. So this is a really exciting event. Um, this year, again, it's going to look very different just due to COVID and everything. But um, what we do at the beginning of the year, usually the weekend after Labor Day, is we bring all of the incoming um, Honor Sorga members, uh, transfer, first year, all of that, and we go to an overnight retreat in Wisconsin where we participate in a lot of team building activities. We do a discussion um, and we kind of just engage with each other and use it as an opportunity to kind of build community and build those relationships at the beginning of the year. Again, this will look very different this year, but we are still going to provide an opportunity for new members to meet one another and engage in that community building. So while we won't be going overnight to Wisconsin, it is going to be, um, we'll kind of build something in, uh, for you all to kind of engage with each other and we will still have kind of a retreat. It'll just look a little bit different. So with that. Thanks, Karina. So as you can tell, there are many special opportunities with the honors program. Really the list goes on and on. And I just want to remind you of a couple of things. Again, it's not the same as a high school honors track. There's no risk in trying the honors program. You don't sign a contract. Uh, if you try a course or two and change your mind, you just can stop taking them. The application link will be available eventually. They're not out there yet for, for fall of 21, if some of you are listening for next year's planning purposes. Um, but the uh, it's an online link that's released through admissions. Uh, and if you are entering this year and want to see if you qualify or you want, maybe you've already applied, whatever, uh, your admissions counselor can assist you with that and locating that link. So if you have any other questions, I'm open to hearing them right now. Either you can kind of flag me down here in Zoom, it's a small enough group, or you can post something in chat, whatever. And I hope to otherwise see you on campus one of these days. and. Um, I hope you'll embrace the challenge of the honors program. But any questions for any of us? We got John on video. So John, do you have any okay. questions? Hi. John, hi. hi. Nice to meet you. I'm John. Um, good to see those of you who I know. Um, so I was wondering, so just, I talked to Karina after the Elmhurst um, University July 1st event, and then the application just kind of got lost in the shuffle of summer school and whatnot. So uh, for the fall term 2020, uh, our classes, I mean, you, I, so much is changing now, too. You know, I just was seeing the emails. Are classes full? Are they, like, for honors classes? Um, um, some of them are and some of them are not. <laughs> so it's definitely possible to still take uh, honors classes. Uh, it, John, have you already registered for this fall? I missed that if you said that. I'm yes. Sorry. You yes. Did. Okay. So probably the best thing, depending on your major, we could either do a, a swap out of, of something uh, for something open. Um, for instance, uh, the honors religion class is still open. If you're trying to take a religion credit and you, and you, you don't, aren't focused on one specific one, we could substitute in the honors religion credit. The other thing would be to consider adding any one, ones or more than one of the uh, partial credit things. So the, mm -hmm. the model grant is still open. Um, the, uh, sur the service seminar is in spring. The intercultural seminar is still open. Um, Directed readings is sort of on a wait list. We could maybe talk about that. But so depending on your interests, we can, mm -hmm. the short answer would be yes, we could still add something okay. or, or yeah. substitute something. And actually feeding into that, I think someone mentioned during the last thing, does the Keystone program count as? So there's a, uh, are you in the pre-Keystone science yes. one this summer? Okay. Yeah. So the Keystone that was referred to on that slide, and I'll be honest, we have to update that one because the this summer one is brand new this summer that the you're in now. Um, so we didn't have that on there. There was a Keystone that was a January that is a January one for first year students. Now I know this summer is for incoming now and um, transfer students and upper upper level students too. So um, it. It's a research opportunity. It's not credit bearing, so it can't count in that 6.5 courses, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. But yeah. a lot of people are turning some of those summer experiences, same with CASE, which is something you'll hear about when you're with us full time now. Um, that's a, pro a program for people that have finished at least a year here in the like next summer. 
for you, um, that can fulfill the research idea, but you'd have to turn that project into say a 495. So if you're working on something right now in the STEM Keystone, this early summer one, and you want to um, potentially create a 495 project out of it, you could talk with Dr. Turk about that. And depending on what you've done, you could add that to your fall load. Okay. And that meets independently, so it won't interrupt your schedule um, as to what you already have set. You know? Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Thank you. If I can just, uh, one word. Uh, yes, that's exactly as Dr. Mulvaney said, and basically what you would do is you would ask your faculty research advisor if they're willing to continue your research with you, for example, or maybe expand it or do and then that's what Dr. Mulvaney meant by saying that you can turn it into your 495. And then you just register for 495 for the fall, and you just maybe expand on what you did in your um, uh, Keystone. But you can, we can talk, you can email me, or if you have any specific questions about 495 on how to do that, uh, how to take up your research from Keystone and include it into your because these are two different things, that's why I'm saying. Yeah. So you would yeah. have to really then still take that 495. But it can be on the same topic where you would do even more research on that topic or something like that. Depends on what your, your main person would be, your faculty research advisor who would work with you and decide what else can be done about that. Okay. Okay, thank you. John, do you need me to send you the application again, or do you still have it? No, I, I have it. <laughs> okay, all right, cool. I wasn't sure because you said things got lost, so I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> yeah, thanks. So the first step, if you send that into us as soon as possible, that'd be great. And uh, then we have one question in the chat box. Yes. So, um, so yeah. do you see it? I do. So oh, okay, Andrew cool. is asking about um, the same time as first year seminar. So Andrew, I'm assuming from your question, you're entering as a first year student. And if so, I get, if, if you've already registered, um, but if, if you're looking to apply to the honors program um, and we're sent an application link or we can talk about your eligibility for this term, then we would just make the simple switch to FYSH. It, it's a first year seminar, but it's one of the honors sections of it. So um, I, to be honest, I'm not sure if, if you've already applied, I'm, I know a lot of the new names on the list, but not all of them yet. So yeah, it looks like Andrew's eligible. I don't see. Or Andrew, if you don't mind unmuting yourself or even showing your camera, that's up to you. But um, then I can get to know who you are. Um, hello. <laughs> um, so have you already registered? Yeah, for classes and stuff. Yeah. Okay, so um, if you're interested now in joining the honors program, that would be great. Uh, Belle said she could make sure you sent that application link again. It, it's not that long to fill out to send to us. And mm -hmm. then I would make the switch. We're just getting, around, we're just starting to assign people to particular first year seminar groups. So we'd make sure you, you went into one of the honors sections, but okay. you wouldn't have to change anything else of, of okay. what you've already registered for. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? I know we've lost a few people, but some of you have hung in there. If, um, and and your, your question about other seminars, you, um, the only other, you could sign up for things like the Model UN still, Andrew, and this is for everybody, or the intercultural seminar, in addition to the four classes that you chose already in the Pre in the registration time when you had your advising appointment. Um, and I can just arrange to sign you up for those. Um, the all, and I, I'm presuming that you probably signed up for a section of English 106. If yeah. you would want to take an honors, there's only a handful of spaces left and there's an advising day tomorrow. So I can tell you that if you want to grab one of those now or right after this call, we could chat. Um, if you think you want to do this, I could switch you into the honors section of 104, but by tomorrow afternoon, it'll be closed. Or you could just start with this uh, FYS honors, whatever okay. you do. Okay. Anything from Brandon or Am Ambrosia? Maybe, maybe I'm not saying that correctly, I apologize. 
Brendan does not have anything. Okay, well, I mean, that being, I mean, your, your presentation was so thorough, that's why there's not that many questions. <laughs> when you do a great job presenting, then you, you get all the questions answered. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. So I have another question, actually. Sure. <laughs> um, so with my major, I don't really think it'd be possible to do like a full term study abroad, so it'd have to be like a J term. Okay. Um, and for that, like with the honors J term study abroad, is that like very, is that only going to be like one program? Like, is it like a very yeah. specific kind of thing or is there? Any, the short term, any, any one of the study abroad short terms can be converted to honors. So let's say we're going to do the program, there's one scheduled, for instance, I know there's one scheduled in Paris in January, this, this coming January, hopefully we're all going to still be able to or going to be able to travel again by January, but, or if, if it was the next year or whatever, um, you're, it's, it's, you know, I don't, I'm forgetting the number, but it, I have taught the, co-taught the course, it's great. <laughs> so it, let's say it's French 300 or something. For you, you would convert it and, and um, do it as French 300 H. And it would appear on your honors on your transcript as an honors course. You would do an, one additional assignment, um, some paper about some aspect of the culture or history or something that you wanted to expand on. That you have an extra week when you come back to turn in. It's just the idea that it's an additional, a slight additional work to the uh, regular course. And to be honest, it's not anywhere near equivalent to a whole semester honors course. But we so want to promote study abroad that if you just do that yeah. little bit extra, we can count it as an honors option. So you can do that with any one of them. There'll be multiple courses. You ordinarily in J term, there is a combination of uh, four or five or six different ones taught for El honors Elmhurst College University students. Um, only and then we also participate in a consortium of with i think it's six or seven other universities in the midwest that in a, broaden that list to another 10 or 15 or 20 courses to choose from so there's things all over the place yeah, yeah it was i remember it being a really cool aspect after coming back i know mary Kay. now i i believe you're offering a course that's actually like a reflection on your study abroad um, but it was a really nice way like when i got back and i wasn't with those people anymore that i still got to continue like thinking about my experience and kind of expanding on it um, so it made it seem like it was a little bit more than just that one month and then i was done so it was it was cool Right. Several, in fact, both of those uh, videos that you just watched were people that were in my uh, course called Honors Global Reflection. That is, um, they did that as, as a short assignment for something that we, um, we did in, in the class, thinking back on their experience and they could do it in a video format if they wanted and um, continuing to kind of reflect on the skills and, and the benefits they got from the experience. That course is a 0.5 elective that many students that do a short term would add another piece the, the spring following or even the year after that. You can do it up to a year or so out, depending on when it fits in your schedule. If you want to, you don't have to, but we try to talk a lot about transferable skills from study abroad. So we do some work with our career ed people too and looking at how do you articulate to an employer say or a grad school program um, what this really meant for you besides, oh, it was great, I loved it, you know. Yeah. Okay, so, yeah. okay great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All right, great. Well, then I think we're all good to wrap it up. I'll stop the recording here. Um,